Hey everybody, I'm going crazy with all of these awesome TV and movie board games. So this is my top five teledramatic board games. What that means is just TV shows that are now board games. And they're really fun to play, just like all the cinematic board games that I did in my previous top fives. So without further ado, I will jump right into it. I mean, seriously, what do I have to complain about? The new guys? They have to wear red shirts. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm sure you've guessed by now, but my number five is... Star Trek! Five-year mission! I think Star Trek Five-Year Mission is a great game to pull out and put on the table when you've got three to seven players who just want to vibe and look at old school pictures of the original Star Trek and the next generation. You can play either ship in this game. All of my pictures come from the original series because that's the series I've watched and that was the the Star Trek that I knew. I never watched The Next Generation, so those characters met in this game. Players are working together to defeat all of these crazy alerts that are going off. They're trying to salvage the ship and, and repair it when they need to, and things are just gonna get crazier and crazier and hairier and hairier until it, the whole thing just kind of like explodes. So every player gets a player mat that has the particular name and image of that character and it's really fun and hokey and I love the old school look of Star Trek, the original series. Make sure that players take a look at their special action that goes along with their character because each character is going to do something unique. Now on a player's turn they're going to reveal one of the cards that they can legally. When the ship is undamaged you can pull from the blue deck. When it's got more damage, you have to start revealing from the yellow deck. And then lastly, when the ship is in dire straits, you have to reveal from the red deck. And when you flip that over, it's going to have iconography of dice. It has colors and it has number requirements. And so there are just all these different kinds of cards that throw challenges your way. And as a team, you have to get through it, but it really does feel like you're running a ship together, you're working together, and things are just going haywire. And that's kind of what happens every time you watch any Star Trek. Things just go wrong. You think you're doing one thing, and everything breaks. And so, you know, you've got Spock trying to keep things cool, you've got Kirk trying to run the, the, the helm, and then you've got Dr. McCoy running around like a chicken with his head cut off, right? Ah, jam! It's a really fun, light game for three to seven players. Again, when you want to play a dice game and when you want to jump into the Star Trek universe. Exterminate! So who is the doctor's greatest enemy? Why, it's Kim dressed up as a Dalek, of course. Doctor Who! Time of the Daleks. I think this game really makes you feel like you are in the TARDIS and you are flying around willy-nilly from planet to planet running into unknown challenges. It's great because you really do feel like you're flying by the seat of your pants. And if you want that feel, it that's why you like Doctor Who, because you're never sure exactly how the Doctor's going to fix it, and you better believe sonic screwdrivers are going to be super helpful in this game. They are an amazing thing to have in this game, which is why it probably only lets you have five. So in this game, you are playing semi-cooperatively, and that might be the reason why this isn't higher up on my list. I feel like the Doctor's the same Doctor, no matter what iteration they are, and this game kind of pits Doctors against each other in a really weird way, because you can only win the game if you're at Gallifrey and you're the Doctor and you're the only Doctor there, and so one person's gonna win. Or the Daleks win and all the Doctors lose. <laughs> you get to go and explore, and when you want to go to a new planet, you take the TARDIS die that has two sides of it as a question mark and the other four are TARDISes and you roll it 
and hopefully you get the TARDIS because then you get to draw the two top two locations from the deck, take a look at them and figure out which planet you want to go to. If you roll a question mark, the TARDIS says, I know where you're going to go and it has programmed something else that you don't even get to choose and you just go there and that just is you drawing from the top of the location deck. When you reveal a planet, you're going to put down these dilemma discs. And the thing about those is that's unknown information. So when you go to one of the zones of a planet, you have to figure out, well, can I probably do this challenge? Can I figure out what this dilemma is? And then it's revealed and it's three blue dice and you have like one blue die and you're like, great, I'm <laughs> never gonna get this. Um, or it ends up being something that you have a lot of dice for. Now, this is a dice game and you are rolling dice and hopefully mitigating them with several benefits and several um, advantages. Now, the game is going to try to thwart those and I, I appreciate that. Where they lock your dice and you're not allowed to flip the side or you're not allowed to do any re-rolls. And I think that's just really clever because it's frustrating. And the Daleks are really strong in this game. We had these time anomalies that kept coming up and just throwing a wrench in all of our plans. And I felt like I was in an episode. I really did. Um, I played the 11th Doctor and I had Amy Pond and Rory and it was awesome. And I wanted all of my favorite characters to be there because I'm a huge, huge Doctor Who fan. So if you want a fly by the seat of your pants, jump from location to location, try to outthink the Daleks in a rollicking dice game with some really fun card draws and companion abilities, definitely try this game. And if you don't want to do the work together because it seems kind of weird or you want to change a rule and make it fully cooperative, heck, do that because that feels a little bit more Doctor Who. Frack frack. Frack, frack, frack. Frack, 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 frack. While Six is not a character that you can play in this board game, she is in the game as a Cylon. Whoa! Battlestar Galactica! The board game! Okay, so Battlestar Galactica, if you were young, used to be a super popular sci-fi TV show and like, I'm talking super popular, okay? This game has all of that wonderful intrigue and politics and leadership and battle and like, ooh, who's a good guy, who's a bad guy? Because in this game, you are given these identities that say you are a Cylon or you're not a Cylon or you're a sympathizer. Now, in the beginning of the game, you have these identities that are crafted for the amount of players that you have, where it's balanced, so not everybody's a Cylon. <laughs> it's the fewer Cylons than not. Halfway through the game, though, you get another card, an identity card that tells you if you've turned. I like that. I like these secret identity games, and I like games that make me feel like I've got to like not relax, I gotta be on the edge of my seat, and Battlestar Galactica does that because you have to work your way around the ship, fight off the Cylons so you can go out and do outer space battle, you can play these um, cards to advance particular markers depending on what team you're on. And I think the best part about this is there are ways to start figuring out who's on your team and who's not. And one of them is by playing these cards. So there are five different colored cards in the game. And when a particular mission happens, it's asking for very specific colored cards to be played. And then there's a number that it has to reach. And then everyone secretly takes one of their cards, or two of their cards, or any number of their cards, and they put it into the center pile, and everyone puts in some cards. Now, if you don't want the mission to pass, if you don't want it to succeed, you're gonna maybe throw in cards it looks like it looks like you're helping because you're putting in cards. Oh, it's got to be the yellows and the greens or whatever you need. But you threw in a blue or a red, and then you shuffle up the cards so no one knows who put in what, and then the cards are revealed and you figure out if you passed. 
because this is again that kind of weird semi-cooperative game to where you think you can trust people and you, like, but you're not really sure if you can trust them. So if you want to play a game that reminds you of Werewolf that's a little bit more intense and, and more strategy based than Werewolf and also reminds you of Shadows Over Camelot, which I adore, then you should definitely give Battlestar Galactica a try. It asks you to be concerned about who is your leader, who is your admiral, who is your president, and how can you most effectively run your group so that you win whatever team you're on. Battlestar Galactica is super fun. <laughs>so while there isn't a memorable line or an iconic moment in this TV show that is my number two, it is by far the coolest TV show on air right now. It's a science fiction show and you should be watching it. More importantly, you should be playing it. It is... The Expanse. Oh boy, The Expanse is exactly like the show and I think what's so great about this game is they consulted the author of the book series S.A. Corey and I love that because the the feel the lore the actions everything in this game is the show and what makes the show so great is that there are all these different factions who have their own MO and their own goals and their own missions and characters and it's just so great. So in The Expanse, you're not playing the Rossi. You're not James Holden, Naomi Nagata, Alex Kamal, or Amos. You don't get to be those people. You can control the Rossi as the player who is the lowest in initiative order, which is awesome because they come to your aid you're actually playing all of the other factions in that show, in the series. You are Mars, MCR, you are OPA, which is the Belters, Protogen, which is the scientist who essentially created the proto-molecule, boo, or you are the UN, and honestly, I wouldn't want to be either Mars or the UN because those two groups have my favorite two characters and they are in the show and I just like adore them so much and so for me it just kind of comes down to fangirl stuff. So there's a really great map that is centrally located for all the players to see. The board is broken down into inner planets, the belt, and outer planets. Each base contains a resource symbol. There's food, water, minerals, and tech. So players get bonus points if they have the most influence on a base with one of those critical resources. And so what you're trying to do is maneuver your fleets and to maneuver all of your ownership, this is an area control game, to the places that give you the bonus for that particular round. And there are six scorecards in the game. When the sixth scorecard is turned over, that triggers the end of the game, there's an immediate scoring, and the game ends. So there may not even be six scorings though, because the way scorecards are scored is that they're taken in the draw pile. There are action cards that are available for every player on their turn, and those scorecards are shuffled into the action cards, and they become cards that you can essentially buy on your turn to do. Because if you buy one of those scorecards, you are saying, I want to score this particular bonus and you get to pick a very specific way of scoring extra things. This is a clever strategy area placement game and it fits into the Expanse universe so well because it's every single faction trying to get theirs and I feel like that just thematically fits so well. I hear it's going to be a killer wedding. You know nothing, Jon Snow. I'm not Jon Snow. But I did see Rob earlier. That's right, my number one. How could it not be? Game of Thrones, 
Now, I want to put an asterisk next to this number one because Game of Thrones was a game in 2003, and I'm pretty sure my math is right that this came out after the books, but before the TV show and the huge success of Game of Thrones. What it does is it gives you the super intense, crazy, chaotic struggle of trying to vie for power and to vie for area in a land that is ruthless and will just tear your heart out. I got that, which you see every single episode of the TV show. I got that from this game. I will never forget the time when I made an alliance with my husband and he betrayed me in <laughs> the last move and won the game! He won the game because he... This game has the strategy planning and the area control that Shogun or Wallenstein offers but it has the theme and it has the recognizable intellectual property of Game of Thrones. And I, I think that's one of the strongest appeals to this game. There are 10 rounds in this game, and the player who controls the most cities and strongholds at the end of that time wins the game. So you really just want to conquer everything. Uh, you can't conquer everything though because you might be spreading out too thin too fast and then you lose all of that headway, all that progress. Um, you also need to stay in favor with particular families and create alliances so that you can squeeze out other players that are maybe in between you or that are becoming too strong. You can work together against other players. Players have order counters that they place onto the map where they are going to do what. The thing is, you never know what's underneath the order counter. So someone says, hey, 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 I'm not invading you, I'm not coming across the... And then they put a marker in your space, which is adjacent to their space, and you're thinking, well, I thought we were friends, I thought we had an alliance. And you don't know if you can trust them or not. You can muster to help out nearby troops, you can attack, raid, consolidate power, march, and support. This game asks you to be a military strategic planner, and I really like those kinds of games. That's why this is number one. This is the gamiest game of all of my top five teledramatic games. I mean, they have these large cardboard cutouts of the Iron Throne, Valerian Steel Blade, and the Messenger Raven tokens, and all three of those are very important positions to have highest up on the track so that you can control those areas of influence. The character cards for the houses are all unique, and they help you in battle when you need to um, attack and defend. The game is just full of player interaction and intrigue, and honestly, I couldn't imagine a better way to spend two to three hours. Again, I really highly recommend five players. You can play with fewer players, but five is where it's at. Give this game a try, even if you think, eh, eh, Game of Thrones, I'm done with Game of Thrones. Don't be done with Game of Thrones. You can have your own epic family fun in battle in this version that's just as good as the TV show.